Welcome, welcome my friends to the Beggars and Brawlers podcast. This is episode 64, recorded Friday the 23rd of December 2022. Merry Christmas if you celebrate it. And today I have a two chapter preview for you as a Christmas inspired gift <laughs> of our forthcoming Tide Collar novel, Rebel of Riddle and Woe. Plus some thoughts afterwards on the joys of world building, not the places, but the in-between places. Okay, so this double feature comes with a spoiler warning as always. If you've gotten this far, you've probably either accepted the spoilers of not having read books one and two, but wanting to read these chapters, or else you are caught up. But I just thought I'd mention it because you also can't listen to this chapter without spoiling the books that came before or necessarily the chapters that came before. So um, hope that you're all up to date. And with that, let's get chapters, what is it now? Four and five of Rebel of Riddle and Woe. Four. We shared dinner and rice wine at a small exchange that night with forced joviality. Esong and Gaxna sit on opposite sides of a smoky fire, not exactly glaring at each other, but close enough. I have to ice the dread building in my chest three times before I stand, the rice wine still making its rounds. I'm gonna turn in early, I say, throat suddenly thick. Every eye turns to me, but it's Esong's and Gaxna's that burn. There's no way to do this without hurting someone's feelings. I just wish I could get mine straight. Still... I know who I want to come with me, and it's the one I've been pining for since I left Saray. Gaxna, I say in the suddenly awkward silence. Do you want to come? Bloods, I hate words, but I hate even more the tension that comes into Isong's back as he looks away. I want to stay, to explain it all, but I don't know what I'd say, and Gaxna is standing up, so I just go. We get in, and light the lantern, and tie the flaps, and after pining all day to be alone with her... The space suddenly feels tiny, and I don't know where to start. Gaxna, for her part, seems to finally relax. She flops back on her mat and rips the wig from her head, revealing her trademark stubble. So, you had a thing with the Dale? My heart lurches. I've been dreading this all day, too. The sea of self-loathing now a solid lead weight in my stomach. We did. Kind of. I mean, I didn't have sex with him or anything, but... You kissed him, she says, her one eye steady on me. I just nod, feeling guilty, but also stupid when she says it like that. It was just a kiss. It just feels like more than that. And you want to do it again? No, I mean, not now that you're here. But if I wasn't, she frowns, he'd be in here right now? My face burns. Probably. He's helped me a lot with the Chronicles. The monocle, you mean, she says. I jump at the opportunity to talk about anything else. You've heard of it? Did Narime say something? She smirks. What do you give me if I tell you? I recognize in her voice the easy, flirting banter we had in Saray. It feels leagues away from where I am right now, but I ice all my confusion and doubt and just try to get there with her. This is what I've been wanting. Anything, I say, letting my robe fall open as I lean forward anything at all. She sidles a little closer. Well then, if anything's on the table, her expression gets serious. Yes, they talked about it a lot. At first, just about the search, about how many people they had out looking, about Yale Lat and some Dale machines, about some ancient relic. I offered to just go steal it for them a couple of times, but they weren't having it. I lean in. So they were trying to make it? That would simplify things a lot. I don't know. I didn't hear much for a while, and then I started hearing just Narimes talking to his cronies, or whatever you call them. Theocrats. Right. Well, turns out you can hear a lot from the pits. It's like they wanted to torture us by reminding us of how other people were walking around free up there. Something about the air tunnels they dug, not big enough to climb through, but connected to the rest of the temple, so if you listened in, you could hear a lot. Her eye softens a little. You were really stuck with a bunch of slop holes up there, weren't you? I was, I say, all my old worry and fear for her flooding back as compassion. But I wasn't in prison like you. I could get out any time. Gaxna, I'm so sorry. It had to be so awful. She looks away. It's over now. That's all that matters. Don't blame yourself, okay? 
I don't have words for how sorry I am, and I know there's no point in insisting it was my fault, even though it was, so I just put my arms around her and hold her close. My fingers pick this moment to start tapping again, and I realize maybe Gaxman knows something about this. Do you recognize that? I ask in the dark. What my fingers are doing. What? Twitching? Yeah, it's been happening lately. I thought it might be a Therican thing. It feels rhythmic somehow. She shakes her head, hair brushing my chin. Scabs if I know. Okay. We lie there a while, me spooned into her back. My fingers stop moving, and I can't help notice the soft curves of Gaxna's body under my hands. Feel the way her hips press against me with each breath, and smell that same smell I remember, like clove and pepper and cardamom. I remember the first time we lay like this, after Estresia broke into our hideout in Saray, when Gaxna finally told me about her past with the Therakins. I've dreamed of being back here for so long. Gaxna catches my hand where it started to roam her body, and it takes me a minute to realize she's not holding it, so much as stopping it. She turns, and I see the first hint of real pain there, the reality behind her bluff exterior. Thea, she says, I can't, yet. I need some time. Of course, I say, pulling back, even as my heart thunders, confused. Can't? Is she still hurt about Isong? Or was it something from talking about the pits? Or is it just me, the one who put her through all this in the first place? Anyways, she goes on, still facing away from me, I started hearing Justin Remes talking to his cronies about a trip to the Dale, how he needed something up there. Once again, I grasp at something simpler and easier to understand than my own heart. The monocle? That's what I figured, that he'd found something out, so he stopped talking to Miara about it. She turns to face me. And that's why I came. I mean that, and I wanted to be with you. But I figured you would want to know, too. Would need it if you're going to stop him, or the floods, or whatever. I grip her tighter, finally hearing what she said through the storm of my emotions. A trip to the Dale. Craftology! That has to be what my father's papers were talking about. The whole thing I went to Duran to get? In the same part that first talks about the monocle, it says they're made from the unity of ways. We didn't know if that was craftology or not. Isong thought maybe it was more political, but... Gaxna scoffs. What does he know? Probably none of them know about it if it's up there and Yaelat's down in Saray. Or at least she doesn't know about it, and she seems to be one of the top dogs of the Frost Eyes. I only half hear what she's saying. The Dale, it's not even that far off our path. We would just head north instead of west at one of the next branchings. Gaxna rolls over. But here's the thing. I don't want to go with your whole gang. I don't think we can. First rule of thievery. The more people in your team, the more likely you're going to get caught. I smile at her, still talking about first rules of thievery, even as her words jar me. But my friends... She sighs. Look, I'm sorry I asked you to ditch them all earlier today. I know this is who you are, that you're not going to rest until you've saved the world or whatever, and they're probably all on board with that. And yeah, I wish you would just drop it all and go live with me on a beach somewhere. But all that passion is one of the reasons I love you, too. I thought a lot about it in the pits, and I figured this is how we can both be happy. What, going to the Dale? I ask, even as my heart contracts at the mention of the pits. I will never stop feeling awful about that. Being a team, you and me, the thief and the warrior, the passion and the calm, the brains and the heart, whatever you want to call us, we complete each other, Thea. And if I have to go save the world to stay complete, then I'm willing to do it. She takes my hand. You get your missions, and I get you. Her words are a river's current just before a waterfall, calling me to join them, jump in with both feet. Just the fact that she thought through all this while she was locked in the pits, the fact that she's willing to give up her whole life to share mine, it means the world to me. But abandoning my friends? It feels wrong in my core, even Isong aside. You have me, I try, feeling like a fake, wishing I had some gentler way to say this. We have each other now. We can have every day and every night together. But, her face is already starting to close off. But, my friends are a team too. I mean, Isong's from the Dale. How valuable would he... Isong, right. I escape the temple pits and travel halfway across the flooding world to find you. 
but you can't give up a bleeding frost eyes to be with me. No, it's not like that. Gaxna! But she's already rolled away from me, everything about her posture accusing. Sure, she says from inside her blanket. See you in the morning, okay? If that fits your plans, I mean. My chest aches like someone punched me. Gaxna, I just, I need some time to think, okay? It's a lot, all at once. You, the monocle, going to the Dale. All I get is hurt silence. Gaxna, I'm pleading now. Nothing. I'm not saying no, I just, I don't know what I'm saying. I just know she's not listening. That I've hurt someone I only want to make happy. And if I know her, something's going to change her mind now that she's dug in. I lie back, lead weight back in my belly, feeling sick, alone next to the woman I love most in the world. Five. Gaxna is gone when I wake in the morning. I have no idea when I finally fell asleep, but it was long enough to overhear Gaxna moaning and crying in her sleep. She never used to do that, and on top of our conversation, it wore me threadbare in the night thinking about what must have happened to give her those nightmares, about how it was my fault. If it's a ploy to get me to agree to abandoning my friends, it's a good one. I step from the tent almost ready to agree to her plan, anything to move this stone in my belly, to add some good memories on top of her nightmares. I'm surprised to find Gaxna working next to Isong, hitching up the team. She turns. Thea, there you are. Thought you were going to sleep all day. Come on, daylight's wasting. Still some of Tewo's amazing porridge, even if it's gone kind of cold. I stare. I have never seen her this cheery. Gaxna, are you okay? She grins. Better than okay. Thought Anon was crazy when he said a clove twist was the best way to start the day, but you know what? He was right. No, come on. Everyone's waiting on you. I hesitate. I'm not going to call her out in front of everyone, and they are ready to go. And behind all the joy and heartache of this last day is still that tidal wall of impatience, demanding I act now, if I'm ever going to stop the floods. So I roll up the tent, load the wagon, and hop on the buckboard, still scraping the last of the porridge from the pot. Gaxna doesn't join. Tewo's teaching me to cook, she calls, hopping in the back. But Isong's there, I almost say, then bite my tongue. Is this her way of trying to do things my way? To fit in? But there's something off about that gleam in her eyes, the too cheery way she's saying everything. No, this is Gaxon taking revenge somehow, in a deeper way. And I can't even say anything about that because the weight in my belly says I deserve it. The rolling hills we've traveled since leaving the Daranese Plain are giving way today to lusher vegetation, land rising steeply to the north, the same uplift that will eventually lead to the Dale Peaks. Over the clop of ox hoof and squeak of iron shod wheels on rail, I hear Gaxna laughing in the wagon bed. It grates on me. I almost wish she'd just be angry or withdrawn instead of this false cheer. I can't imagine what this is like for Isong. I turn over a conversation as trees crowd the iron way, and the air grows fragrant with tiny, blossom laden vines hanging from the trees. It's no surprise Narime and Miara knew about the monocle, too. They surely have their own copies of the Chronicles. It's also completely believable that someone's made or found a monocle in the Dale, and we just happen to be close to them right now. So, why am I not excited about it? And why, I keep asking myself, did I not sneak off with her last night to start our adventure and save the world? I'd like to say it's just loyalty to my friends, but I've already proven myself the kind of person who will abandon anyone for the sake of her mission. And I think that's it. This feels too perfect somehow. Gaxna finding me out here, loaded with the information I need, and ready to go on a dangerous mission with me. I know the time in the pits changed her, the nightmares are proof, but the Gaxna I knew probably wouldn't even have mentioned what she overheard and would have argued a lot harder for just running away somewhere and letting the world drown. I shake my head. Or is this just the seed of doubt Isong planted yesterday, finding roots in a complicated situation? I don't think he was doing it out of malice. But neither do I think he can see Gaxna in an unbiased way. Which is part of the reason I haven't said anything about her new information to anyone. They deserve to know if I decide the Dale is the right path, but I need to decide for myself first. I laugh out loud. Good luck with that when I can't even decide who to sleep with. A nudge on the arm brings me back to my surroundings. It's Anon, 
holding out a clove twist. Lit, even. I take it, smiling. He's been unusually quiet all morning, probably sensing my mood, or reading the currents around how different Gaxna is acting. Good place for an ambush, he says, blowing smoke at the trees crowding the rails. The iron way is less tended here. Each exchange yard seems to care for the rails around it, but they've grown sparse as the jungle has thickened. It is, I say, senses suddenly coming alive. The branches are nearly overhead now, just a pace or so of clear ground to either side of the rails, and yesterday's insect song is gone in chirps and bird calls and the occasional raucous howl of a monkey. Not only could we likely not see bandits coming through the dense foliage, we wouldn't hear them either. My heartbeat rises. I used to do them, you know, Non says, as if he's discussing the weather. Ambushes. Not this far out, but in the plains around Iran. We had to get clever there, use the grass and the hills. Here you could basically just walk up and take it before they knew you were there. It's like all my anxiety shifts in an instant, from Gaxna and the Dale to a possible ambush. I take some deep breaths. A day is ranging ahead, and he's good at what he does. He's used to this kind of terrain, from Bomani. Why did you leave the city, I ask? I don't know why I'm trying to keep up normal conversation, but it feels important. And if Anon used to do this, and he's not worried, maybe I'm overreacting. He shrugs. Things that get too sticky in Duran, I go work the rails for a while. I wasn't always as good as I am now, so sometimes I'd need to leave for a while. Only so many places to hide in the city. Besides, he kind of liked it out here, even if the food is slop. I never really left Saray before I had to flee. I shift on my seat. I've never been in jungle like this. This is jungle, right? Yeah, that's not what's bothering you, though. He says it so casually, like it's a topic we've been on most of the morning. Maybe we have. I sigh, heaviness warring with uneasiness inside. No, it's not. I get it, he says, nodding toward the wagon bed, where it sounds like Tewo is trying to teach Gaxna to play the lute. Isong has to be gritting his teeth. I open my mouth to say something, but they'll be able to hear everything. Here we are in the middle of nowhere, and still no privacy. Anon holds up a hand. There were times out here where we'd scope a caravan out and decide to hit it and set up our whole plan. I was usually the mark, you know, stumbling out into the road or playing dead or whatever. Anyways, it took a lot of work to set it up because you couldn't really reuse spots. Caravansers talk to each other. So we'd do all this setup and wait all day, and then the wagons would roll over the hill and you'd realize something was wrong. He draws on his twist and I frown, trying to watch the forest and also figure out where he's going with this. I catch a glimpse of a Kifte ahead on the rails, which settles me a little. He hasn't spotted anyone, and he hasn't gotten shot yet. That's all good. They'd have more guards out, or another caravan would be right behind them, or a scout would see us, or whatever. And your first reaction is to pull back, or to quick make some new plan. But you're already committed by then. Run, and there's going to be a chase, because they know you'll be back. Make a new plan, and you won't have time to get it set up, and they'll probably see you doing it anyway. Every time we'd choke, somebody'd die. I look at him, interested now despite myself. So, what did you do? Depended on how smart my team was, but the best thing to do? He flicks his clove stub into the woods. The best thing was always to stick to the plan, even if it felt like it didn't fit. That's what we found out anyway. He pulls a new twist from his pocket and reaches over. Give me an ember? I hand my twist to him, I've barely smoked it and sit back against the worn cedar backrest, watching the trees without really seeing them. The chronicles point to Yemla, which means a river post. Gaxna wants us to go to the Daul alone. Isong thinks she's a danger, but he's got his own reasons for thinking that. And me? My heart is a jungle without a road, full of sounds and suspicions with no clear path out. Anon inhales deep and hands my twist back. So we still headed to the next river post? You know, you're flooding perceptive for this being a thief. You sure you never studied water sight? Anon makes a hurt expression. Just a thief? That's a whole industry you're insulting right there. I'm the top of it. Or I was. I glance at him, wondering how much he knows or is guessed about what Gaxna wants. Whatever it is, he will have told the rest of the crew. That's just how Anon is, and I love him for it. Yeah, the river post, I say, surprising myself with how confident I feel. 
It's the most logical choice. I've known that for a while, because there'll likely be another post before a road leading to the Dale, so we might as well get more information before we decide. I just couldn't see that for all the emotions in my way. But if you're lost in a jungle, the best move is probably to keep going. And to remember, you're not walking it alone. A smile. And after that, maybe up to the Dale. He chokes on his smoke. The what? The Dale, I say, and I hear the laughter cut off in the wagon bed behind me. So be it. I'm not keeping secrets from my friends. Gaxna overheard Narimes talking before she left Saray. It sounds like he thinks there's a monocle up there, and he's going to get it. That's amazing, but the Dale? Offers. That's, I don't even know if I would want to hit that. Shouldn't we just send Esong or something? Send me where, a voice comes from the wagon, and Esong is out a moment later, his face still in the neutral mask he wore this morning. Tewo's not far behind him. No one's going anywhere yet, I say as Gaxna joins them, her too bright expression gone in a scowl. Except to the river post, to get information. We still need to know if Yamala's alive, if we can find him, and see if he remembers anything more about his immersion. But yes, there's a chance there might be a monocle in the dale. Her scowl deepens, but Isong is the one who speaks. I don't know if that would even be possible, he says, his long strides keeping pace with the wagon easily. The peaks aren't like the lowlands, where you just have city-states and outlands and nothing's really guarded or policed. We have borders, guards, watchtowers, and the only foreigners you see inside are slaves. Perfect, Anon says, either not reading Isong's skepticism and Gaxna's scowl, or ignoring them. We all get taken as slaves, or Isong leads us in like he's our owner, and then once we're in, we get assigned to wherever the monocle is. Gaxna and I steal the thing, you all break us free. Done! World saved, right? I almost laugh at how easy he makes it sound. But we don't know where the monocle is in the Dale, right, Gaxna? It feels so weird to talk to her this way, like we're in front of a crowd. Her scowl deepens. No. This probably feels like a breach of trust for her, that I told them what was probably supposed to be a secret, that I'm even thinking of going altogether. But they all care about this just as much as I do, and I was never going to keep secrets from my friends. That's just who I am, and for once today, I don't feel bad about it. Isong clears his throat. The peaks are not a small place. Alethea and I have already talked about this. Gaxna flushes at that. But there are seven citadels, each with their own repositories of ancient artifacts and craftworks, and many more kept in individual houses. Even if we could search without worrying about getting caught, it could take years to find it and all that. And you forget that so long as Yeolat is in power, I'm in exile. People will remember me, he grimaces. Little makeup, maybe a haircut, we'll hide you good, Anon says, but his voice has lost a lot of enthusiasm. We can handle it, Gaxna cuts in, obviously meaning a different we. Thea and I have done lots of hits. This is just one more. There's no way, Isong cuts in. You'd be taken, killed. You don't know what my people are like. I know enough, Gaxna growls, and just when I feel the conversation spinning out of control, Tewo holds up a hand. Just that but he has such a deliberate way of doing it, either that or because he talks so rarely, that we all quiet, looking to him. We all want the same thing here, he says in the sudden silence, to stop the floods, but we need more information, where the monocle is in the Deo and whether Yemla lives. If he does, and it is in the Deo, perhaps he can point us to it, or tell us how they made it. We are not enemies, and our plans are not opposed. Alethea is right. We should wait until we know more. The river post will tell us what we need to know if we have ears to hear. It's like he's poured cool water on a bed of coals. Gaxna still simmers, and Isong is pointedly not looking at her, but neither looks ready to rip each other's hair out anymore. Thank you, Tewo, I say. I need to learn how to talk like that. He didn't say anything different than I did, he just said it better. For now... Anon was pointing out how easy it would be to get ambushed out here, so let's focus on staying alive. Isong, how long till the river post? He shrugs. It's hard to tell distance without landmarks, but tomorrow maybe? It's in a place called Chengai. We stop in another rustic exchange for the night, where a massive bulk thrusts up from the forest floor, relic of a bygone age. 
Centuries of decay have flaked layers from what might once have been a tower or an upthrust fist, obscuring its shape and creating a dead patch around it. Whatever it was, the jungle gives it a wide berth. Maybe not the best place to stop, but I'll still take it over the dark tangle on all sides. Gaxna keeps up her false cheerfulness around the fire, charming everyone except Isong with her stories from the streets of Saray. Ikifte listens, rapt, as he works on one of his tattoos. Anon accepts her as one of his own kind, and Tewo takes her in stride, as he seems to everything. I feel a little more settled since our talk. Telling them about the Dale was the right decision, and so was insisting on the river post before we make any decisions. Still, the lead weight returns to my belly when the fire burns low. I stand to turn in for the night, dreading the conversation that's coming with Gaxna. The alone togetherness of the tent that I ironically used to pine for. To my surprise, she doesn't get up when I do, taking another twist from Anon instead. She comes to bed much later, when basic tide has almost carried me to sleep and is clearly in no mood to talk. I leave it like that. I know I've hurt her, but depending on what we learn tomorrow, I might have to hurt her a lot more. If there's no new information on the devil, but we find out Yemla is alive and somewhere we can reach, I'm going to have to choose that no matter how much my heart pulls me to run away with her anywhere. Because it pulls me to run toward my goals with Isong, too. To stop the flood, whatever it takes. Her moans start almost immediately, and my fingers do their tapping thing again, sounding out a rhythm in the night. There's no way I'm sleeping like this, so I lie awake and listen, trying to find a pattern in the taps, or some intelligible phrase in her nightmares, something to give me the guidance I need. I find nothing, so I seek solace in my own breath, praying that the river post will make things clear. All right, so I hope you enjoyed those. There was a lot going on in that double feature. Um, and you're probably seeing uh, some of the things that I talked about in our previous preview babbles coming up here, like the ramifications of uh, the contest between Isong and Gaxna paying off and how Alethi is trying to balance those um, and also the team dynamics that come into play and uh, some of that stuff. What I was thinking about when I look back on these chapters was the different experience of writing this book compared to books one and two. Uh, Daughter of Flood and Fury is totally centered in Saray. We basically never leave and we kind of hardly leave the Blackwater district, um, but we definitely never leave the city. It ends with her leaving the city. Um, book two starts with her in transit, but she very quickly, I think in chapter two, uh, ends up in Duran, and that's where the rest of the book happens, except for, again, the epilogue. Um, and this is a world of city-states, and I think when you write city-states or write the capitals of nations or peoples, it's kind of easier world building wise, because you can say the Saraian people are like this. They believe in gender. They have two divisions. They have witches and they have monks. And this is how the police force works. And these are the fountains in the city and the culture around it and all of that. And it's really easy to write a monolithic culture, even though, okay, it's not easy because you want to make it realistic, but at least it's one thing. And same thing with Duran, a city of merchants and people who are obsessed with wealth. And here's the magic that comes from that. And here's the hierarchy that they've set up and the way that laws work when money is the highest. Well, not actually money, but possession is the highest good. It makes a lot of sense within that city. But in the hinterlands between them, you know, it's just like that scene in Monty Python where um, they try to convince them that they're subjects of the king and they're arguing about like what arcane form of political system they actually have. You know, like I think it's a it's a strange artifact of modern times for us all on an entire continent to agree that we belong to this government and this set of people. And even within that, within the United States or within the UK or within Brazil, or within Uganda, you'll find, um, you know, so many ethnic variations, cultural variations in different places and what they eat and how they talk or what language they speak, how they dress. You know, there is just naturally variation as we travel through a world. And in a world like Alethea's that is hardly politically unified at all, the places that are a ways outside of these like city states where cultural has become sort of monolithic are really a blending and the landscape is a blending. So it was really interesting for me and kind of a new challenge to write 
this book, which is essentially a travelogue, and have them never really arrive at a place, but always be in between places. And so the people and technology and food and culture that they meet is always a kind of blended um, people and culture. And it isn't monolithic in the same way. And, you know, it's still really affected by the geography it's in. In these chapters, we saw us come out of kind of the dry plains outside Duran and up into the higher, very wet and lush jungles and how Alethea is kind of uncomfortable with that as she's sorting through everything else. Um, and I just found that really interesting. I think that it's kind of like the next level of world building to go from this is what these people are to be like, this is the weird kind of in-between that these in-between people are. Um, and I think that that is just like we were talking last time about how kind of like the next level of detail that makes you come up with these um, minor characters or plot points that ends up being more interesting than the main ones. I think also when you've developed some kind of like monolithic touchstones in a culture or a world building, then the in-between things, like the people who fall through the cracks of a societal system or the people who live in between societal systems, those become much more nuanced and I think also more interesting because they're always negotiating something instead of just fully believing in it. So funnily enough, this is the quote unquote Christmas episode and I'm fully aware that not everyone celebrates Christmas. And I think that it's more interesting for us to to negotiate the holiday that's so big for some people and doesn't matter for others and be aware of that and how it inflects, you know, like, because I still, my family celebrates Christmas, but in very different ways than like a passionately Christian family would, or someone who's in a place where the snow doesn't fall during that time, all of those things. I just think it adds more nuance. And it was for me much more interesting to write. So I hope that for you reading it, getting to read some in-between places in Alethea's world instead of always being stuck in these uh, like sort of crystallized places of magic and culture, because obviously to some extent, the magic in her world is influenced by cultural beliefs. In Saray, it's the belief in gender that gives men and women different powers and sort of like splits up very similar powers into blood and water and all of the things that come from that. And in Duran, this um, obsession with possession has given them a magic that's literally tied to wealth. So I think those crystallized things are interesting, but it's also more interesting to see how things work out here. Um, and we do deal with some of the magic that happens out in these places, but uh, I think that they're kind of actually the future of where this world is going. But I thought that it was hope that it's interesting for you to see those in between places in the world. So I'll stop blabbering, but I enjoyed a lot fully fleshing out this world and shading in the places in between the dots that it already filled in. And I think we are probably getting to the point where I need to make a big old world map. I've held off. I don't think I've given you any maps for this world. I have my own, but they're not pretty. <laughs> so maybe it's time to make some pretty ones. Um, anyways, I hope you enjoyed that double feature. I hope that you're enjoying the holiday season. If it is one for you, if it's cold or warm, or you're about to get together with family, or it's just another day in the grind like it was for me when I lived in Japan, felt very strange. <laughs> but um, most of all, as always, I hope that you have some good books to keep you company and you're well in the process. So until next time, I think I've probably got one more preview like this and then hopefully the audiobook is out and you can just grab it and listen to it without my babbles appended to the end. But I'll be back with that in a week or so. So until then, read on. For more information on Levi Jacobs and his books, including the award-winning Tide Collar Chronicles, visit www.levijacobs.com. Or for a free audiobook, only available to podcast listeners, go to www.levijacobs.com slash free. Thanks for listening and read on.